Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Lawrence Cram. I'm the Acting Vice-Chancellor. And on behalf of the Vice-Chancellor, Ian Young, who's currently overseas, and the ANU, I'm delighted to welcome you all to the 2011 Nuranen Oration, the 15th in the series. The annual lectures organised by the Australia South Asia Research Centre in the College of Asia and the Pacific and is part of the ANU public lecture series. In introducing the lecture, I would like to acknowledge the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet and whose culture is among the oldest continuing cultures in human history. The lecture honours His, Excell His Excellency Dr. K. R. Narayanan, past president of India. Dr. Narayanan inaugurated ASARC in 1994 and maintained an active interest in its work. Unfortunately, he passed away on the 9th of November 2005 after the 2005 oration was delivered. Hence, our present oration adds significance as it represents our homage to Dr. Narayanan. I'm particularly pleased to welcome a number of dignitaries to the oration. These include the former Governor General of Australia, Major General Michael Jeffrey and Mrs. Jeffrey, and Her Excellency Mrs. Suya Singh, Chief Commissioner of India. <coughs> Our speaker today is Dr D. Sabaro, Governor of the Reserve Bank of India. Prior to his appointment, Dr Sabaro was the finance... Oops, wait a minute. <laughs> Got to do this right. Dr Sabaro was the Finance Secretary to the Minister of Finance, Government of India. He had earlier been Secretary to the Prime Minister's Economic Fo Advisory Council, <coughs> Lead Economist in the World Bank, Finance Secretary to the Government of Andhra Pradesh and Joint Secretary in the Department of Economic Affairs, Ministry of Finance of the Government of India. Dr Sabaro has wide experience in public finance. In the World Bank, he worked on issues of public finance in countries of Africa and East Asia. He managed a flagship study of decentralisation across major countries of East Asia, including China, Indonesia, Vietnam, Philippines and Cambodia. Dr Sabaro was also involved in the initiation of financial reforms at the state level. He has written extensively on issues of public finance, decentralisation and a political economy reforms. He holds a BSc Honours in Physics from the Indian Institute of Technology in Karangpur and an MSc in Physics from the Indian Institute of Technology in Kanpur. Dr. Sabaro also holds an MS degree in economics from Ohio State University. He was the Humphrey Fellow at MIT during 1982-83. He has a PhD in economics in, with a thesis in fiscal reforms at the sub-national level. He was a topper, I think that must be a very good thing to be, in the All Indian Civil Service Examination for entry into the Indian <coughs> Administrative Services. And I guess as a physicist, I could understand why that happens. He was one of the first students from the prestigious Indian Institute of Technology to join the Indian Civil Service. We would like to thank the India-Australia Council for supporting this lecture, and I welcome all members of the Council who are attending the oration today. Before introducing our lecturer, I would like to request Her Excellency Mithas Suja Singh, High Commissioner of India, to read out a message from the President of India, Mrs Singh. It's a privilege to read out the President's message on this occasion. I am happy to learn that the Australia South Asia Research Centre at the Australian National University is organising the 15th K.R. Narayanan Oration on the theme India and the Global Financial Crisis, What Have We Learned? by Dr. Duguri Subarao, Governor, Reserve Bank of India, at the University in Canberra on June 23rd. The Indian economy has posted robust growth in recent years. While several other economies of the world have contracted, India has continued to fare better than other countries because of its domestic demand and investor-friendly policies. There is growing interest the world over 
in the Indian economy and our developmental model. I have no doubt that the oration will go a long way towards addressing this interest, focusing on the lessons learnt while tackling the challenges faced by the Indian economy and the opportunities shaping <coughs> its growth and development in the years to come. I wish the event all success. Pratibha Devi Singh Party. Thank you. Thank you very much, High Commissioner. May I now request Governor Sabaro to deliver the 2011 KR Narayanan Oration. Good evening. First of all, my thanks to Australian National University and to the South Asian Research Centre for inviting me to deliver the KR Narayanan Oration. I know that very distinguished people have delivered this oration in the past, so I'm very pleased and honoured to add my name to that list. Late President Narayanan was a distinguished diplomat, a reputed parliamentarian, a capable minister, and above all, an erudite scholar. He was born at the very bottom of India's social pyramid and rose on to occupy the highest office in the country, with assets, no other assets than hard work, humility, and integrity. President Narayanan was in office from 1997 to 2002, when uh, globalization, the current wave of globalization as we understand it, now was in full swing. When President Clinton visited India in March 2000, when he hosted a banquet for him, this is what he said. Mr. President, we do recognize and welcome the fact that the world has been moving inevitably towards a one world. But for us, globalization does not mean the end of history and geography one of the lively and exciting diversities of the world. In hindsight, I think that was a very thoughtful remark. Because if you look at 2000, that was a time when this idea of Francis Fukuyama, end of history, had a profound influence all around the world. But as much as globalization might be inevitable, History and geography need not be destiny if we learn lessons of uh, history and do not repeat the same mistakes. This indeed is the topic of my oration and my tribute to President Narayanan, to seek the lessons of the crisis that we've just gone through so that we can make this a better world for all of us. A lot of people ask this question, is this time different? In other words, has this crisis been different from past crises? I know in Australia you refer to that as the GFC. So is this GFC different from the past ones? If you look at it in a fundamental sense, the causes of all financial crises are the same. They are global imbalances, loose monetary policy, high levels of leverage driven by irrational exuberance. In that respect, this crisis has been no different from past crises. However, this crisis has been different from past crises in terms of its manifestation. First, this crisis, all past crises, if you look back on them, they all happened in individual emerging economies or in regions. If you look at Russia, Argentina, Turkey, Mexico, or East Asia as a region, they all happened in specific countries or specific regions. All those crises happened because of retail banking problems. And in all the past crises, because it affected one country or one region, there was the rest of the world to fall back on. There was the multilateral institutions to provide support and other countries to provide support and get back it up. This crisis was different because, number one, it originated in the United States, the richest country in the world. It hit at the very core of the global financial system. As opposed to past crisis, which originated from the retail side, this crisis originated from the wholesale banking side. And of course, when the US went into a crisis and pulled down advanced economies and the rest of the world, there was no buffer to fall back on. All of us went down together. So all emerging economies went down, and India was no exception. What I propose to do uh, during my oration is to answer these questions 
how was India hit by the crisis, why was India hit by the crisis, and based on those two answers, how did we respond to the crisis, and then go on to look at eight big lessons of the crisis uh, from the Indian perspective. Let me add a personal note here, which is that uh, I took office as the governor of the Reserve Bank of India on the 5th of September 2008, nearly three years ago. <laughs> Fanny and Freddie happened on the 6th of September. Lehman Brothers collapsed on the 15th of September. <laughs> and world financial markets came to the brink of collapse on the 16th of September. So in India, very rightly, people think I brought on the crisis. <laughs> And they ask me, when is the crisis going to be over? So I tell them, when my term is going to end, <laughs> they have the answer. So let me get on with uh, the first question, how was India hit by the crisis? What indeed was the impact of the crisis? In terms of GDP growth rate, in the three years before the crisis, 2005 to 2008, we were clocking 9.5% on the average. In the crisis year, 2008-9, growth went down to 6.8%. In the three years before the crisis, 2005 to 8, exports were growing at 25%. In the crisis year, they came down to 12%. In the year after that, exports actually declined by 2%. In the years before the crisis, we were having a lot of capital flows coming in, far excess of the current account deficit. In the crisis year, capital flows fell short of current account deficit. In the years before the crisis, the rupee was depreciating. And during the crisis, it depreciated. Actually, between January 2008 and March 2009, the rupee depreciated by 30%. So that's how we were hit by the crisis. How were we hit by the crisis? We were hit through all these channels that you're not familiar with, the finance channel, the confidence channel, and the real channel. The finance channel is a bit uh, complex, so let me explain that to you in a minute. There was a lot of foreign investment into Indian equity markets and debt markets before the crisis. And when there was uncertainty, uh, there was flight to safety. People deleveraged, they got out of India. In the process, uh, it put pressure on the exchange rate, it put pressure on the equity markets. Again, Indian corporates, they were borrowing vigorously outside the country from external sources. Suddenly they found that their external sources of credit had dried up, so they brought the credit demand home. That put pressure on the credit markets. Again, Indian corporates were putting their excess money into the mutual funds, into the money markets. When they ran short of money, they suddenly started withdrawing money from the mutual funds, and that put pressure on the money markets. So all our financial markets, our equity market, our foreign exchange market, our debt market, our money market, all of them came under pressure. The confidence channel, again, if you go back to around mid-September 2008, what do you see? You know, every day, one storied institution falling. You had Lehman, then followed by AIG, Merrill Lynch, Wells Fargo, UBS. Uh, they've all gone into history now. So every day, one institution that we had grown to admire had started falling, and there was lack of confidence all around. Nothing really happened in the Indian financial markets, but it was just the contagion of confidence from outside that sort of sent a hiccup. Banks started hoarding money, and there was some sort of, I wouldn't say seizure, certainly a liquidity market sort of uh, curled up. And uh, for a few days, there was a problem there. The transmission through the real channel, of course, is quite straightforward. You understand that, that uh, there was recession, there was a uh, slump in demand for exports, and so we were hit too. Now the second question, which is perhaps more intriguing, which is why was India hit by the crisis? Actually, there was dismay in India that we too could be hit by the crisis. And that dismay arose from mainly two, two strands. First, people said, uh, look, you say that you had regulated your financial sector quite well, much like Australia has. Our banks did not have exposure to the toxic assets. Our banks did not have exposure to the subprime assets. They were quite prudently regulated. 
So if you're shouting from the rooftops that your financial sector is safe, how can India be affected by a crisis that had its roots in the financial sector? That was the first cause of dismay. The second cause of dismay was that, look, you say that your drivers of growth are domestic. You do not depend on exports so much. So we are having a global recession. Countries like Germany, countries like China, Japan, who depend on exports, we can understand they are hurt. But why should you be hurt? The answer to both those questions is globalization. That India, in a 10-year period, had integrated with the rest of the country much more than we realized and much more than we cared to acknowledge. Our perceptions in India were shaped by what happened in the Asian crisis. Asian crisis, we were not affected because, among other things, and importantly, uh, we were not integrated into the world. But in the 10-year period, we had become more globalized than we realized. So, let me give you some numbers just to illustrate that. The way we measure integration is to take the two-way trade flow as a proportion of GDP in the 10-year period of the Asian crisis, 98 and 2008. That ratio doubled from 19.6 to 40.7. So trade integration got deeper, but what is even more important is that our financial integration got even more deeper as illustrated by two-way trade and finance flows. That had multiplied two and a half times from 44 to 112 percent, the proportion of GDP. So how did we respond to the crisis? The government came out with a fiscal stimulus in the Reserve Bank. We came out with monetary accommodation. Uh, but in the Reserve Bank, we were guided by two factors in our response. First, we said that our financial markets must continue to function normally. That when around the world financial markets were ceasing, our markets should function every day normally. Second, we must see that credit continues to flow to productive sectors. So what did we do? We ensured that there was ample rupee liquidity. We ensured that there was comfortable foreign exchange liquidity, and we made sure that credit continued to flow. <coughs> we took conventional and unconventional measures. I don't want to go into details of them. That's not very relevant three years after the crisis. But I do want to say that there was criticism against the Reserve Bank, which is understandable. Uh, people said that we were timid rather than being bold. They said we were hesitant. Rather than being confident, they said we were behind the curve rather than being ahead of the curve, all sorts of expected predictable criticism. I did not defend the Reserve Bank at that time, but I do want to offer a defense now, uh, which is, first of all, if you go back to September 2008, there was so much uncertainty all around the world. I mean, we, nobody knew what was going to happen, not just us in India or in Australia or in East Asia, but even advanced economy governments and central banks didn't know what was going to happen. Forget the next day, they didn't know what's going to happen the next hour. So, with so much of uncertainty around, it was unrealistic to expect that a central bank that is at the periphery of the crisis could react or respond in a proactive sense. The second thing is you must realize that unlike in advanced economies where the crisis transmitted from the financial sector to the real sector, in countries of emerging economies, I believe that's true of Australia as well, the crisis transmitted from the real sector to the financial sector in the reverse direction. So our policy response had to be different. I want to give you an example. Yesterday we were talking about it actually at the lunch meeting I had with Australian bankers in Sydney, which is that, you know, at that time, uh, England, UK, uh, they had taken that step that we, this, all, all regulators, all governments insured deposits in the bank to some extent, to varying extents. In the UK, they said we're going to insure all deposits uh, just to give confidence to depositors not to withdraw money. They had done that in the UK, that's fine, but they needed to do that. But in India, there was clamor that we should do that too. 
And we were agonizing over that. What happens if we had insured deposits? People would not have felt safer, actually. People would have got panicky. That, after all, why is India, which is not having any problem at all, why are you insuring deposits of people? So we decided, after a lot of discussion, that no, we will not insure deposits. We will let it remain like this. Not The cost was a consideration, but more importantly than the cost was what we were going to do to the confidence of ordinary people if we made them believe that our banks were less safe than they actually were. So I want you to understand that reacting to a situation in a crisis like this by doing, copying what others are doing is not such a straightforward situation of response. This is my final slide on the India situation, which is uh, what is the outlook now? What is the post-crisis situation? We recovered out of the crisis sooner than most other countries. Uh, that is because, as I said, our financial sector has been relatively unexposed to the toxic assets. Also because our export sector was small. But inflation too caught up with us. Uh, first, it started as inflation triggered by supply shocks, a food shortage because of a deficient monsoon two years ago. But over the last two years, it's become generalized, more broad-based inflation, um, both supply factors and demand pressures. So it's quite uh, an explosive cocktail of factors which are driving inflation in India at this time. We raised rates 10 times in the last 15 months. But one thing I want to say before I move away from this slide, which is that managing recovery is incredibly more complex than managing the crisis. Because during the crisis, what needed to be done was quite clear. And indeed, what the precise thing that you did was less important than the fact that you did something. So I realized very soon that every week you had to be go, up, go out there like an alpha male and say that, look, we are here, uh, we're doing this, uh, nothing will happen to you. So I realized that it doesn't matter what you did, how insignificant it was, that you kept doing something. On the other hand, in managing the recovery, we have to be, we have to finish it very well. You've got to be quite precise in calibrating this because of all sorts of uh, domestic and international implications of being out of phase with the rest of the world. To give you a simple example, if our interest rates are very high and advanced economy interest rates are low, as is the case now, a lot of capital will flow into our countries. More capital than we need, and that creates its own problem. That's something that I'll talk about later. So we have to manage and calibrate the exit much more carefully then we calibrated the entry into the accommodative phase. So let me move on to the lessons of the crisis, which is the second part of my oration. A lot's being written about the crisis, uh, about the lessons of the crisis. Somebody very famously and notoriously said that uh, this crisis is too valuable to waste. We must learn the lessons of the crisis. That, uh, there is creative destruction. We must destroy old ideas and create new ideas. Schumpeter said that. But not everybody agrees with that. Some people think that it's too early to draw the lessons of the crisis. We must wait back, let the crisis settle, and then get the lessons out more carefully, uh, more studiously. I think Zhao Wenlai it was who was asked uh, sometime, what do you think of the French Revolution? And he said, it's too early to say. So perhaps it's too early to draw the lessons of this crisis. But practical policymakers do not have the luxury of sitting back and saying that we will wait till we get all the lessons of the crisis. So I'll get on to them. I've listed eight, but depending on the time, um, we will get through as many as possible. Maybe I'll cut down as we go along. The first crisis, the first lesson, I want to say is that in a globalizing world, decoupling does not work. Actually, when historians take a long view of what happened in the first decade of the century, uh, I try to make a list of the things that will catch history. They'll probably talk about the rise of uh, 
worldwide terrorism. They'll talk about maybe the deepening of the internet culture. They'll probably talk about the rise and fall of the global financial sector. The question is, will the emergence of emerging economies be one of the defining features of the first decade of the 21st century? That, I think, will depend not only on what emerging economies accomplished in the last decade, but how they consolidate on those gains uh, going forward. Anyway, before the crisis, there was this intellectually fashionable idea that emerging economies have decoupled. What that meant to say was that even if advanced economies went into a downturn, emerging economies will escape that downturn because uh, of their improved macroeconomic management, their resilient financial sectors, their robust external reserves. The crisis invalidated that theory because all emerging economies got pulled into the whirlpool. It's actually quite uh, intriguing if you uh, think about it, I expect many of you are students of economics. And uh, you're taught in economics that uh, a, a problem that arises in a non-tradable sector is confined to the economic boundaries. It cannot transfer across economic boundaries. And for good measure, textbooks of economics give housing as a quintessential example of a non-tradable sector. So it's intriguing that a crisis that started in a non-tradable housing sector in the US has snowballed into a global housing crisis, then into a global financial crisis, then into a global economic crisis. And that's because housing, like every other thing, had become financialized. You know, this is financialization of globalization, which has caused the crisis. So, after the crisis, many people have studied decoupling and said that uh, the IMF, for example, said if you look at the crisis period, 15 months, there was an initial period of decoupling when advanced economies started going down, but emerging economies remained afloat. Then in the thick of the crisis, there was coupling because they went down and we went down too. But as we are emerging out of the crisis, again, we're seeing some decoupling because they're still yet to recover, whereas our recovery is well on its way. So, the answer to the question is, uh, have we decoupled? I think has to be more nuanced than it was before the crisis. Now I would say that we need to distinguish between trend decoupling and cyclical decoupling. Trend decoupling is that there is a differential between the growth rates of advanced economies and emerging economies, and that will continue. To that extent, we are decoupled. But around that trend, in a cyclical sense, our fortunes are tied to the fortunes of advanced economies, so cyclical coupling will continue to be there. So we got to be more nuanced. You cannot, I think part of this was hubris, that you decouple, your, you will sail on regardless of what happens to the rest of the world, that's no longer true. Let me go on to the second lesson, which is that uh, global imbalances need to be redressed for the sake of uh, global stability. If you think about the causes of this crisis, you know that uh, a crisis as complex as this one could not have been caused by a simple or a single cause. But in all our perceptions, it's the collapse of Lehman Brothers on 15 September 2008 that will remain as the cause of the crisis. In fact, future textbooks will write about before Lehman and after Lehman. But regardless of that, if you think deeper, there were two fundamental causes of the crisis. The first was global imbalances. Second was financial sector developments. And early on, people used to think of them as two independent causes that came together by coincidence and caused the crisis. But now if you think deeper, you will find that actually one is, they're correlated, they, they, uh, they're in a way interrelated. First, let's talk about imbalances. Uh, global imbalances got built up because of uh, large savings uh, and current account surpluses in China and other Asian economies. 
and they were mirrored by large deficits and leveraged consumption in the U.S. In short, Asia produced and America consumed. But how did these imbalances get built up? If you look at the wave of globalization, 80s, 90s, and early 2000s, there were three, three distinct factors driving globalization. There was trade, there was finance, and there was uh, labor. So globalization of trade, we know if you take trade as a proportion of global GDP that had gone up so much in the 25 year period between 1980 and 2005. Globalization of finance was even more vigorous. The increase between 1980 and 2005, 25 period, year period was even stronger. But by far the most influential, I think, was globalization of labor. Imagine India and China joining the global economic system. That's adding three billion people to the world economy. An enormous and almost abrupt increase in productivity. That, in fact, is the main cause or the main factor responsible for the great moderation that the world saw in the first decade. All of us had good growth, low inflation, so that was caused by globalization of labor. <coughs> so the chain of causation from these imbalances to financial crisis is interesting, but not obvious. What really happened was as China and other Asian economies started having current account surpluses and having savings, and also tried to maintain a competitive exchange rate, these savings turned into central bank reserves. And what did central banks do? They did not invest them in a diversified portfolio. They invested them in U.S. treasuries and the other advanced economy government securities. So what really happened was risk-free real interest rates around the world went down. So rich country investors started searching for yield that dropped credit standards, uh, uh, erosion of credit quality, and we had this crisis brewing. So in a way, the subprime move, wave, was caused by global imbalances. During the crisis, global imbalances came down uh, somewhat, but what is worrying is that as we're getting out of the crisis, they're building up once again. In fact, many people ask whether we are sowing the seeds of the next crisis in trying to solve this one. So in the G20, there is this move about uh, strong, sustainable, stable growth. And uh, there is, they're talking about a mutual assessment process, which is peer reviews of important countries, systemic countries. I don't want to get into details of all that. But what is important is that at the global level, if we decide on certain indicators to measure imbalances at the country level, which must then be put back to the country and ask the country to adjust, we should not be wooden-headed about it. It is not that your savings rate is so much, therefore you must adjust, or your current account deficit is so much, so you're causing global imbalances, you must adjust. But you must say in what circumstance the current account deficit is high. India's current account deficit is relatively high, but we do not cause global imbalances because we get a lot of inflows and you know, we try to manage that. So at the global level, as much as we are concerned about ensuring that there is no recurrence of these imbalances, we are ensured about making sure that there's a code of conduct for countries. We must also make sure that the code of conduct is applied judiciously, not in a wooden-headed sense. Let me move on to the third lesson, which is that uh, global problems require global coordination in a, as a message that's relatively simple. Actually, the crisis demonstrated, as I said earlier, how interconnected we are all through the trade, finance, and confidence channels. The crisis originated in the U.S., as we all know, and it radiated in two, direct, in two, two ways. First, it spread from the U.S. to other advanced economies, then, then to the rest of the world that is geographically, 
Then sectorally, it spread from housing to other productive sectors. All countries tried to douse their fires domestically by themselves, and they found that they were not being effective. And very soon, we realized that this is a global problem that requires global coordination. When historians look back on this crisis, I am pretty certain that the London G20 summit in April 2009 will be looked upon as a turning point in the management of this crisis when global leaders showed extraordinary determination, unity in coming with a package that all countries must accept and implement. There were differences, but those differences were, were sorted out, compromises were made with the ultimate objective of uh, resolving the crisis. Today, people are asking this question that that famous unity that G20 had shown during the crisis, is that weathering away? Are you uh, breaking down under the pressure of uh, um, peacetime problems? Uh, like, there are actually two problems with the G20. One is the tyranny of the present, that you're not able to with the weight of current problems is so high that you're not able to see beyond today. And the second is the tyranny of uh, self-interest, that you, you're guarding your self-interest so much that you're not able to see beyond that. Regardless, uh, I would think that to some extent, we cannot expect the same type of unity that was shown during the crisis to be shown during normal times. Some differences of opinion are bound to be there. In fact, I would go a little beyond and say that some difference of opinion might actually be value-adding because it would get a good compromise out of that. I had actually seen G20 meetings before the crisis, during the crisis, and after the crisis. There is a distinct realization that in order to resolve global problems, you need global solutions. And second, that no global solution is worth its name if it does not take into account the interest and the voice of emerging and developing economies. So what do we have on the global agenda today? We have uh, currency wars that we were talking about until a month ago, global imbalances, US dollar as a world reserve currency, protectionism, financial sector regulation, all these issues. I think some wisdom is arising out of that, but what is important is that we, we continue to remember that we need to be together because in a world divided by nation states, there is no constituency for the global situation. We need to remember that, that even as we speak for our countries, we also need to remember that we are part of a more integrating global system. Let me move on to lesson four, which is that uh, price stability and macroeconomic stability do not guarantee financial stability. Now, what is financial stability? That's very difficult, notoriously difficult to define. If I was in a smaller gathering, I would have told you it's a joke, but I would not tell you now. Uh, <laughs> but uh, what is financial stability is that any sharp disruptive, abrupt movement in economic fundamentals, in the interest rate, in inflation rate, in exchange rate, and that disruption in the financial markets would be financial instability. Before the crisis, governments and central banks thought, very good, we will take care of price stability, we will make sure that there is no inflation. We will make sure that there is macroeconomic stability. In other words, we will make sure that interest rates are stable, exchange rates are stable, are predictable. And we will have financial stability as an automatic derivative of price stability and macroeconomic stability. But the crisis taught us that you can have these two, but you can still not have financial stability. For example, we saw the great moderation right in the, the period between 2001 and 2007, when the entire world had extraordinary growth, developed countries, developing countries. We had low inflation. We had relative financial stability. But in the midst of that extraordinary stability, we had one of the most extraordinary financial instabilities coming across. 
So that lesson was very clear. In fact, some people make even a stronger assertion, which is that if you have price stability and macroeconomic stability for long enough, that itself would cause financial instability. Why? Which is that you're lulled into complacency and you tend to underestimate, I was going to say misunderestimate, so underestimate uh, the, the cancer of financial instability brewing underneath. It's like having a normal child. If a child is doing well in school, uh, you tend to neglect the child. And in the process, you tend to neglect other problems. The child may be okay in academics, but the child may be having personality problems. But you tend to neglect them because you've neglected the child. It's like that. So as much as you take care of price stability, you take care of macroeconomic stability, you've got to take care of uh, financial stability. Lesson five, which is that uh, microprudential supervision is necessary but not sufficient. <coughs> Needs to be supplemented by macroprudential oversight. Somewhat technical, but it's important. Which is that before the crisis, what were we doing as uh, central bankers, as governments? We took care of individual institutions. You take care of Commonwealth Bank, it's a good institution. You take care of ANG Bank, good institution take care of West Bank, good institutions, so you've got four banks in Australia, you take care of them, so you're okay. You're not okay. Even if you have four healthy institutions, four healthy institutions can together make you an unhealthy system. So the lesson is that a collection of healthy institutions does not necessarily make a healthy system. Why is that so? That is so because of there is pro-cyclicality. Every bank behaves the same way. ANG behaves the same way as Westpac as behaves the same way as Commonwealth Bank. And people ask me this question, why is, why is so worried after all, uh, you know, what's the difference between Commonwealth Bank and Rio Tinto? Okay. Would I be worried if Rio Tinto fails? I would be worried as it's a big corporation, but I would be more worried if Commonwealth Bank is failing. Why? Because a financial institution is not just a corporate. Financial institutions are interconnected not only within the country but around the world increasingly. So if one institution anywhere in the world fails, it can spread around the world very easily. And that's indeed the reason why all of us are concerned about the Greek crisis. After all, what is Greece? It's a small country in a distant part of the world for all of us. But the reason we are focused on what's happening in Greece and how Europe is trying to resolve that problem is because there is interconnectedness in the financial system. <coughs> so, somebody said, a very, one famous economist got a lot, lot of mileage for saying this. I wish I had said this. He said, uh, if something cannot go on forever, it will eventually stop. <laughs> okay? So, that's what happened to the subprime. Okay? Uh, it, you just cannot keep, keep that happening. Uh, the system failed. But before I move on from this lesson, I want to give a counter lesson, which is that we should not get carried away by this macro prudential, uh, because you can make a mistake. You know, it's, it's nice to be cautious. As governor of the Reserve Bank, if I'm cautious, I will protect Indian economic system from a crisis. But I might also be paying a very high price for that. So you've got to constantly weigh the costs and benefits. And you've got to keep, keep track of what's the counterfactual. Because in real world, nobody would be able to say, if you did not raise interest rates, what would have happened? Now that's a matter of conjecture. But in economic management, as policy managers, we have to be very conscious of managing the balance between caution and the cost we pay for caution. So, you can make, a, for example, in, let's say I increase the provisioning for Indian banks. If I do it too early, I can choke growth. If I do it too late, I can let an asset bubble build up. So you've got to do it at the right time. Timing is very important. So let me move on to 
the next lesson. Let me also tell you that lessons get relatively short as we move on. Uh, lesson six, which is that this is actually quite high profile, and a lot of people, including in Australia, in my meetings over the last two days, this had come up almost invariably in every, every meeting, which is that uh, we're having capital flows coming into emerging economies um, because, uh, as I said earlier, we've had to raise interest rates because of our inflation management. Advanced economies have kept their interest rates still low because they're still recovering. And because of this interest rate differential and because of this quantitative easing and credit easing and whatever the name you call it by, that causes capital flows coming into the emerging economy. We do need capital flows. It's not as if we don't need them. We need foreign savings, but we need them just enough to meet our uh, current account deficit. So in my um, investigation into this issue, I've now come out with a law of capital flows, which is that no country ever gets capital flows in the exact quantity or at the exact time it wants. You always have too much or too little or always at the wrong time. And it's a very difficult problem to address because if flows are coming in much more than you need and you don't do anything, your currency will appreciate. That appreciation is unrelated to fundamentals. So your export competitiveness gets hurt. If you intervene in the foreign exchange market, you will pump liquidity into the domestic market, and that causes inflation. If we intervene and then sterilize the resultant liquidity to combat inflationary pressures, that raises interest rates. So no solution is totally benign. And whatever you do, uh, you'll be criticized, but more important than criticism, whatever you do, you've got to be very careful about both the short term and the medium term consequences. This uh, debate on capital flows has been a very heated debate that's actually frowned on moderation. There's people who say that uh, uh, you can actually, you should not put any controls on capital because they're always distortionary, they're ineffective, they're difficult to implement, they're easy to evade, entail negative externalities. On the other hand, there are supporters of capital flows who say that uh, if you control capital flows, your monetary policy will be more effective. You will be able to determine what type of flows you can attract. I want long-term flows. I can get them in. And you will ensure macroeconomic stability. This debate has festered for several decades, but it resurfaced during the crisis. What is significant about this debate and this crisis is that for the first time, the orthodoxy about capital controls has changed. One of the most orthodox institutions in the world, the IMF, which for a long time said that emerging economies should not control capital, has had a change of heart and a change of mind. I've said, now said that in certain circumstances, it will not only be advisable, but also inevitable for emerging economies to control capital coming in. So, even after that, what type of capital controls we must institute, how and when remains a very contentious issue. I think about it in this way, that you can have strategic capital controls and tactical capital controls. Strategic controls are the type that we have in India, which is that you have a playing field, you have the rules of the game, you tell market players what type of flows you will attract, what type of flows you want. You want equity flows over debt flows, you want long-term flows over short-term flows, uh, you want stable flows over volatile flows, you have the levers for that, let the world know what you want. Use those rules transparently, predictably, in a fair way strategic control. Then you can have tactical controls, which is that you've flooded with con uh, capital, and then you institute in a manner of uh, firefighting, which is uh, actually the problem of uh, Latin American countries, which are fighting capital flows now, because they had opened up their capital accounts, 
uh, they've had to institute tactical controls, which is, uh, causes uncertainty. So, one of the lessons of the crisis is that capital controls are not only unavoidable, but advisable. And if you have strategic controls, your need for tactical controls is that much less. Let me move on. Uh, oh. okay. uh, this is, uh, okay, another five, ten minutes maybe. Uh, which is, uh, this is actually interesting from the student perspective, uh, that economics is not physics. Uh, because, actually many of you may have heard about this, a few months into the crisis, uh, the Queen went to the London School of Economics and all the economists had lined up to welcome her and she said, how come none of you saw the crisis coming? And all these people just uh, went very embarrassed, went white in the face. Actually, the Queen's question resonated with ordinary people around the world because ordinary people felt let down by economists and uh, economics. What went wrong with economics, many things went wrong, but one of the things is that people say economists suffered from physics envy, that they wanted uh, economics to be like physics, that you come out with very sophisticated models, very fancy math and exact numbers. Remember these books which talked about questions like uh, uh, why do drug dealers live with their mothers? Or why, why do sumo wrestlers, uh, what's common between sumo wrestlers and uh, school teachers? I mean, did we ever think of those questions in uh, normal times? Okay. But economists thought of those obscure questions and answered them and uh, everybody was impressed. And economists' opinions were sought not only on uh, questions of economics, but on everything around the world, including how to cure AIDS and how to uh, you know, get uh, whatever. So, economics is a social science, unlike physics, which is an exact science. Just think about it. You know, I cannot change the mass of an electron, no matter how I behave. But I can change the price of a derivative by my behavior. That's the important difference between physics and economics. So, to give you another example, uh, the mass of an electron does not change whether I'm in the world of Newton or in the world of Einstein. But I can, in the real world, how firms, households, governments behave is altered by the reigning economic ideology. Just say that, you know, well, we all know that uh, supply equals demand, but that's not necessarily true. Uh, that's uh, economics, you know, it need, supply need not be equal to demand. But in physics, energy lost is equal to energy gain. That has necessarily to be true. That is one of the most fundamental laws of the universe. So physics, ca ex excuse me, economics cannot be like physics. So, but I also want to say, uh, respond to this question by the Queen. I'm finishing in two, five minutes, uh, Professor. Uh, I, uh, the, the question that Queen asked, I have a response for that, which is that it's not as if economists did not see the crisis coming. They did. If you go back to the pre-crisis times, people predicted that there would be a currency crisis. In the event, it imploded as a financial crisis, which is to say that when a system is building up, you do not know where it will implode, but you do know that it will implode. Same thing about the Greek crisis. Uh, which is that, you know, if you go back about shortly after we recovered from the crisis, a lot of people said we might have a fiscal crisis. They said we might have a fiscal crisis, not because they, re they knew that Greek was, uh, uh, Greece was uh, on a prodigal path, but because they said governments are going to finance their banks, rescue their banks, and they're going to borrow for doing that, and therefore there'll be a fiscal crisis. But we... We are having a fiscal crisis in parts of the world, but that's nothing to do with governments rescuing banks. In fact, governments are making money out of rescuing banks. So, as we move out of this, one thing quite unconnected with this, but let me say this, which is that before the crisis, we used to say, you know, for every real sector problem, no matter how complex, there is a financial sector solution. Now we say, for every real sector problem, no matter how complex, 
there is a financial sector solution, which is wrong. <laughs> okay. This is my final lesson, which is that uh, having a sense of economic history is important to prevent and resolve financial crisis. You know, there's this book, uh, This Time is Different, 800 Years of Folly, Financial Folly, by Kenneth Rogoff and uh, Carmen Reynard, which is by this title, which is that this time is different. Which is to say that every time a crisis occurred, ordinary people would ask economists, why did this occur? Why did you not see it coming? And economists would say, no, 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 we know all this. You know, this time is different. We knew, learned the lessons of all past crises. We could have prevented a crisis if it happened for the same reasons. This crisis is happening for a different set of reasons. And uh, Reynolds and Rogoff had gone into very impressive, painstaking research over 800 years to show that all financial crises, the fundamental cause is the same, which is people get exuberant. So, why is that important? That is important because as students of economics, as professors of economics, it's very important that even as you learn economics, you also learn economic history. I'm signing off on this uh, because it has uh, special relevance for India, emerging economists, maybe for Australia too, which is that there is a sense that, look, we've managed very well. We've insulated ourselves from this crisis. Therefore, we have insulated ourselves from every future crisis. I think it's very important that we do not succumb to that sense of hubris because we've insulated ourselves by good management, probably by fortuitous circumstances and context. That does not mean that there will be no future crisis. We will continue to have crisis, and what is important is that we prevent crisis as much as possible, but should one occur, we have the policy and the management cap capacity to manage that crisis. So thank you very much for this opportunity. I really enjoyed talking to you. Indeed. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> Governor Strange from the Wall Street Journal. Simon, I'm just interested in um, uh, how you see monetary policy settings currently in Asia. Uh, you've mentioned today that uh, inflation in India is uh, an explosive cocktail because of uh, uh, a use of phrase, phrase you use. Uh, are some of the problems with inflation in India driven by the uh, loose policy settings uh, elsewhere in Asia? Before I answer your question, I request you not to use that phrase in whatever you report, because uh, that can be quite explosive in itself. Uh, <laughs> so I, I just wanted to make the point that uh, there is a, a combination of supply and demand side pressures. Okay. Uh, I was uh, shortly before I set out for Australia, I saw the World Economic Outlook of the IMF, which my, some of you may have seen. Uh, what the IMF had said is that growth uh, in emerging economies will be as they had predicted before. Indeed, even in uh, advanced economies, maybe it will drop by 0.1 percentage point or something like that. But importantly, they said inflation concerns have become more important both in advanced economies and in emerging economies. Uh, that, uh, by to us as India, that did not come as a surprise because we've been experiencing inflationary pressures uh, for the last two years. But uh, the fact that other emerging economies too are having inflation is uh, to be expected because of uh, uh, fast growth and demand pressures. So I would see that uh, I would see continuation of uh, monetary tightening. Uh, across emerging countries. In, uh, in India, if you're uh, looking for some guidance, uh, we said uh, in our statement of 16th of June that uh, the Reserve Bank will have to continue with its uh, anti-inflationary stance, and that's what I would like to repeat here. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, please. In, you say, um, India's prosperity, economic prosperity, has been largely due to investor-friendly policies. And I would like to know, please, if 
the, the prosperity has been gained at the expense of the environment at the lower levels of India's social pyramid, please. India's lower levels of? Social pyramid. India's what? I'm sorry, I didn't get you. Social pyramid. Social permit? Pyramid. Social pyramid. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Thank you very much. Excuse me. Yeah, okay. Yes, uh, 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 we've had investor-friendly policies. I'm glad you say that because a lot of people say that they're not friendly enough. Uh, but uh, uh, the constant effort endeavor has been to make them investor-friendly. It's a judgment call about uh, uh, where we drew the balance between environment protection and the need for investment. And every country is having to decide on that the difficult issue. As a poor country, we cannot say that uh, um, we will let no investment take place because we want to protect our environment. Nor can we say that we will sacrifice our environment altogether because we want investment. And I, you perhaps know, um, I mean, I, because you're present here, I assume that you're interested in India and you're familiar with India. A lot of environmental damage also happens because of poverty. So we're struggling with it. And uh, there is more news about uh, India's environmental sensitivity uh, coming out of, uh, because there is more media attention to that and uh, more uh, uh, investment into activities that have an environment interface, like mining, for example. So around the country, in the policymakers, in the civil society, there is greater awareness about environmental sensitivity. In a fewer number of people, there is also an awareness of drawing the right balance. About the social pyramid, uh, I, I'm trying to interpret your question, which is that, like President Narayanan uh, was born at the bottom of the social pyramid. In, in most prosperous countries, the wealth stays at the top. Seven million? Wealthiest? The wealth stays at the top. Uh, yes, to some extent, but, uh, but there's been some, uh, uh, you know, when uh, uh, in a rising tide all boats rise, right? Okay, so the rich may be getting richer, but what's, what's important about India, as I see, is that the poor are not remaining poor, or nor are they getting poorer. As used to be the acquisition 15, 20 years ago, they're also getting better. Maybe not as fast as the rich people, but the poor are certainly getting better. And uh, because of that, uh, in fact, one of the reasons we weathered the crisis was because in the rural areas, uh, consumption held out. Uh, and uh, another thing I want to say uh, is this, that among the mega trends in India is this terms of trade shift from modern urban sectors to rural sectors. For about 50 years after independence, we got our independence in 1947. For about 50 years, we ran a very regimented regime, an economic regime with licenses, permits, etc. Uh, protected our modern sectors, which by definition shifted the terms of bias, the terms of trade in favor of the modern sector, industry and services. Thus changed in the last 10 years. And uh, rural incomes are going up, terms of trade are shifted in, term, in favor of the farm sector. So I cannot give a precise number about whether the rich are getting richer faster than the poor are getting better, but the poor are certainly getting better at a much faster pace than they used to. Here and there. Uh, thank you. Um, we were talking about exuberance earlier, and Australia is going into a rather exuberant mining boom. I'm just interested in your thoughts as to whether um, we are putting too many of our <laughs> uh, it'd be presumptuous uh, for me to be able to comment on the Australian economy, uh, but I think from what I heard uh, from the from my co uh, colleague governor yesterday and uh, from your treasurer, whom I met shortly before coming here, it's not as if uh, 
Australia is investing on you know, putting all eggs in one basket. They've said that the service sector is doing well. It is, it's probably true that mining sector has become high profile and uh, is attracting a lot of attention because of uh, the terms of trade, because of the exchange rate, etc. But Australia has quite a diversified economy, I would imagine. So I think you're far from uh, putting all your, uh, what should say, all your engines of growth in one basket. One more up back there. Yes. Uh, Dr. Subrat, Stephen Hannes from the ANU, thank you very much for a very interesting talk. Pleasure meeting you. Yeah. You mentioned, uh, I think your lesson two was that global imbalances need to be redressed, and you mentioned this build up of the foreign exchange reserves among emerging economies as a contributing factor to the crisis. And I just wondered whether you're seeing <coughs> continuing post crisis, and in particular, you know, what India's stance is on exchange on reserves. And <laughs> I had that in my notes, I did not go into it because I did not want to be very India-specific, but first about India. What's the stance on foreign exchange reserve management, on capital account management, which is, I don't know Latin, but somebody said it's festina lente, which is make haste slowly. Okay? So that's our policy on capital account. We will continue to open, but we will make it gradual. Our roadmap will be calibrated as we go along. In particular, on foreign exchange management, um, we were quite an outlier in terms of uh, capital flows because uh, after the crisis, because of quantitative easing, etc., when flows had gone into emerging economies, flows had come into India too. But we were able to absorb them without the currency moving up very much because we had a current account deficit. <coughs> However, I what our policy towards foreign exchange management, uh, exchange rate management is that uh, we will intervene in the market to manage volatility. We will intervene in the market to manage macroeconomic instability. But we will not intervene in the market to target a specific exchange rate. So we've not accumulated reserves. Any accumulation will happen in the normal course, but not as a, as a result of deliberate policy. About the rest of, uh, rest of Asia, uh, you know, this, this has become quite a contentious debate about how much of reserves you must build up. I subscribe to the view that emerging economies should have some level of reserves, but how much is your self-insurance is a judgment call. Uh, during the crisis, some of you who followed it very closely would have remembered that the IMF was coming out with this uh, <coughs> What do they call it? Call uh, uh, um, conditional fund, unconditional fund facility, or something like that. Which is that it's a line of credit that emerging economists could just draw when they need it, without protracted negotiation. In effect, what they were saying is that you don't have to build up reserves; you can wind down your reserves because the IMF facility is there. I believe that we cannot wind down our reserves to zero. We need a minimum amount of reserves for self-insurance. But building up reserves without uh, an end and building up reserves as a consequence of uh, intervening in the exchange rate market, I think, is uh, inadvisable. That's a long-winded answer to your question. Then, uh, if I can thank you very much for a most illuminating talk and some very interesting questions, uh, I think I'd like to ask Professor uh, Jar, the Executive Director of the uh, Centre, to propose a vote of thanks. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Good evening, and thank you all very much for coming to the 2011 Narayanan Oration, the 15th in this series. This lecture, along with the message from President of India, Her, Ex Her Excellency Srimati Pativa Patil, will soon be printed and copies will be available with ASARC. And they'll also be available for free download from the ASARC website. At this time, it is my pleasant duty to bring this oration to a close by thanking the people and organizations who have contributed to making this year's oration such a success we have a 500 seating capacity here, and it looks quite full to me. It's fantastic. Um, this oration is named after 
the now deceased Dr. K. R. Narayanan, former president of India. He inaugurated SARC in 1994 and continued his support to SR throughout his life. We have in the audience here senior public servants from the Commonwealth Government of Australia, the Indian High Commissioner, Her Excellency, Mrs. Sujata Singh, and other senior members of the Indian High Commission, as well as a number of distinguished guests from the Australia India Council and the ANU. In addition, we have a very distinguished speaker who has played a key role in India's recent transformation. Following from President Narayanan, President APJ Abdul Kalam continued his support for the oration series. We are indeed grateful that the current President of India has continued her support for this lecture series so that the Narayanan lecture now forms part of the institutional links between the ANU and the office of the President of India. The High Commissioner of India in Canberra and her staff have provided invaluable help in coordinating our contacts with the President's office and the logistics for this oration, for which I am very grateful. We look forward to the continued support of the Indian High Commission to the Narayanan oration and other ASARC activities. Now I would like to thank uh, the Australia India Council, which has, uh, has in the past, supported this uh, year's oration financially and, and in many other ways. I thank our, our acting vice chancellor, Professor Lawrence Cram, for chairing this session. At the RBI, Mr. S. Sinha, who is with us today, and a number of his colleagues in the office of the governor provided invaluable logistical support for this oration. At ASARC, Stephanie Hancock has, as usual, worked tirelessly and efficiently in, in organizing the details of Governor Subarao's visit. I would like to thank her most sincerely for her many efforts. I would also like to thank Mr. Deepak Rajgupta, chair of the ACT branch of the AIBC, for his help in advertising this event. Finally, it's, our, it's my turn now to, to thank our speaker, Dr. D. Subarao. SARC is delighted and honored to be associated with him. We are sincerely grateful to him for taking the time and the trouble to prepare this lecture and to undertake a long journey to be with us today. SR's list of Narayanan speakers reads like a who's who of important Indian economists and public figures, and Dr. Subarao is a stellar addition to this list. The Narayanan oration now ranks among the very best India lecture series anywhere in the world. Coming to the lecture proper, Dr. Subarao's speeches, as you have no, no doubt found out, have the reputation of enthralling audiences of varied backgrounds and even conflicting intellectual persuasions. His oration today has been encyclopedic, profound, and provided a most erudite account of what we have learned from India's experience with dealing with the global financial crisis. The rapt attention ad and admiration with which this August audience has received this oration are evidence both of the importance of the topic covered and the clarity and profound scholarship of Dr. Subarao's exposition. Thank you very much.